Another really good way is to practice gratitude. Right? Sorry, what was the book called? Again? A Complaint Free World by Will Bowen. Really great book, just a small book. You can read it in the morning, actually. Uh, but gratitude's another really good way. There's a really great exercise in gratitude where you, you actually, you write down in the morning 50 things to be grateful for, and you've got to finish your list by the end of the day. And I know people who have been very depressed and found, sat for 10 minutes trying to find just one thing that they're grateful for. Then you might notice your cat rubs against your leg and you go, well, my cat loves me. Then you notice you're breathing and you go, well, I'm alive, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a start, you know. But you carry a wee piece of paper in your bag or in your pocket and you're walking about and you might go down and buy a newspaper and the, the shop assistant says, oh, have a nice day. And you say, oh, never noticed that before. The shop assistant says, have a nice day. It's another thing to be grateful for. And throughout the day, instead of looking at the things that bug you or the things that you, you, you think are not working in your life, because you're filling out your wee piece of paper with 50 things, your mind becomes attuned to looking for things that are actually working, looking at the things you ordinarily wouldn't notice. And we find that we start to notice things that are, work, that are going really well. And, uh, and mo many people find they've got to increase the list from 50 to like 70, 80 things after a couple of weeks because they're noticing so many things that they're grateful for. And many people, after 30 days, feel completely different. They've totally transformed themselves after that time. But one of the reason I'm telling you this is because this is something that we can do. And not only does it affect our minds, but it affects our bodies. Because <clears throat> I mentioned at the start, every thought causes changes in the microscopic structure of your brain. Do you know those plasma balls you get? You always get them as Christmas presents, and you put your hand on one, and it goes <laughs> then you move your hand, and it goes like that. Your brain is doing that all the time, in response to what you think about. In response to movements. Every time I move a muscle, my brain's going bzzz, in the area that controls that muscle. If I go like that, the area of my brain that controls that muscle is going bzzz, And if I do that muscle, the other area of the brain that controls that muscle goes bzzz, over there. But the same thing happens when we just think. As I talk, as I think, as you just use your imagination, your brain is also doing that. And your brain is constantly changing. Scientists call it neuroplasticity. neuroplasticity. We used to think the brain was this hardwired lump of stuff, you know, you're genetically born with these connections and that's you, your brain is stuck like that. That's totally not true. Your brain constantly changes to the moment, to the last moments of your life on earth. Your brain is constantly growing and changing and adapting. You know like the way you have, you're making bread and you knead the dough, right? Well, as you knead the dough, you're changing the, the structure of the dough. In a very similar way, we're actually changing the microscopic structure of our brains constantly. And when, what happens is if you change your life, change your <coughs> attitude about something, then you change the structure of your brain. And it's really true that you say a leopard can't, a leopard can't change its spots. Well, metaphorically speaking, it can if it spots our personality, right? Because when, when we're thinking about something, the, there's like 100 billion brain cells on the, the cortex of your brain, which is the outer limit, the outer coating of the brain. About 100 billion brain cells, they look like we starfish. But they're starfish with wee branches at the end, like branches from trees, and they reach out and they connect with each other like that. And that's how the brain forms what's called neural connections, connections between neurons, neural connections. And as we think the same kind of thoughts, we form more and more of these connections, more and more connections. But see when we stop thinking that way and think in a different way, then the first thing that happens is all these old connections begin to dissolve. It's often called neural pruning. You know the way you can prune a hedge to change its shape? Well, we prune the brain. We prune back connections because the, the brain doesn't need them anymore because we're not thinking that way. We're not fertilizing them, so to speak. We start thinking a different way. So you go from pessimism to optimism, for example, then a different part of the brain that processes how you're now thinking, for example, the front part processes lots of kind of, say, optimistic things, compassion, spirituality, gratitude, that kind of thing, are often processed through the front of the brain. Then what happens in this new area of the brain, we form brand new connections. So we've actually gone from here and dissolved all these connections and formed brand new ones. So we're actually, that's how moment by moment we're changing the structure of our brains. If we put a lot of work into changing how we are in any moment, then we actually, actually change the structure of the brain. It's incredible, actually changing the brain. But it goes even further than that. Because not only are we affecting the brain, but what we think about and how we feel dumps chemicals into the bloodstream. So the chemicals called neuropeptides, they don't just hang around in the brain, but they travel throughout the body. And they're, they're like wee, chem wee molecules with shapes 
and they're looking for parts of the body, they're looking for cells that they can connect with. So if, for example, you had something that was like that shape, then it would be looking for a, a part of the body, like a cell, the surface of a cell, that had the same shape, like that. Like a docking port. So in, on the surface of cells, you have these things called receptors. They're a bit like docking ports, I suppose. You know, a spacecraft docks on a, on a, a space station. If the spacecraft had that shape at the bottom, it would need to find a docking port that had the same shape, like that. It would do no, it would do no use if the docking port was that shape, and the spaceship came down like that, it would burst the hole right through it, <laughs> right? But it's very similar on your cells. You need docking ports that are the same shape, of they're called receptors. And on the surface of your cell, you have hundreds, thousands of receptors, and they're receptive, they're docking ports for lots of different chemicals, but docking ports for chemicals from the brain. So cells have receptors for chemicals, neuropeptides, produced by what you think about and how you feel. So as we think and feel, process the daily experiences of our lives, in our minds, we produce chemicals that swim right throughout the body and they find docking ports on the surface of cells all throughout the body. All throughout the body. So in a very real way, our body feels the effect. Our body actually feels the effect <coughs> of what we think about and how we feel. The body is actually responding to it at a cellular level because these wee do chemicals fit onto docking ports. And it's not just shape actually. Chemicals, all chemicals wiggle. They, do, they, they wiggle, for example, Simplest molecule we know, one of the simplest molecules is water, H2O. It's hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. It looks like a wee V, the inverted V. Hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. But the hydrogen and oxygen vibrate. It's called the stretching frequency of the OH bond <laughs> for anyone who's interested in organic <laughs> chemistry. I did my PhD in organic chemistry. The, the stretching frequency of the, the OH bond, it vibrates like that. And as it vibrates at roughly 3,300 centimetres to the minus one, <laughs> what <are you> that? <laughs> <laughs> Science for you then it gives off, it's a frequency, it's vibrating, like that. So all molecules naturally twist and rotate and stretch and vibrate. So a, a, a docking port will also recognise the wiggle, the vibrations of a molecule. So even if it's not the same shape, it will resonate with the wiggle, with the vibration. So that's another way chemicals from the brain interface with the cells. But incredibly, when it interfaces with the cells, it changes the cells. And a very simple phenomenon, do you know when a uh, you know women's intuition? We call it women's intuition, you have a gut feeling, right? Do you know a gut feeling is actually a chemical change in the gut, right? It's not just a subjective thing, it's actually a chemical change in the gut. Because the neuropeptides associated with the feeling of instinct or intuition, maybe that shape, they find cells which are very high in receptors for that shape, and guess where they are? In the gut, right? Very similarly, when you have, you know, that kind of spiritual thing where you go, ah, I really get it, something really makes sense, and you get a spine tingle, right? You ever got that? Or you feel shivers like that? Mm -hmm. That's because the chemicals produced in the brain associated with that kind of, I get it, have, or that shape, and they've got receptors of that shape on cells up the spinal column. So that's why you physically feel an instinct or an intuition. But it happens all over the body. And, and what's incredible is our cells actually change what they do and how they appear depending on what we're thinking about. It's incredible.